the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello, loyal listeners and first-time friends. I'm Will Beeson, and this is another episode of ReBank. Today, the focus is on alternative lending, one of the original fintech verticals. Surprisingly, in nearly 80 episodes, we've never really discussed this area. After holding off for so long, today we're hitting you with two interviews, one with Jens Volacek, the founder and CEO of SpotCap, and the second with Christoph Reich, founder and CEO of Iwaka. As one of the earliest areas of fintech focus, lending has come a long way, and it certainly had its ups and downs. Perhaps more to come when we hit a less happy place in the credit cycle. We talk about that with Jens and Christoph, along with what differentiates their models, how balance sheet lending compares to peer-to-peer lending, where SpotCap and Iwaka outperform, and much more. If you haven't signed up to our newsletter yet, head over to bankingthefuture.com and do it now. We're going to be creating a lot of new content across audio, video, and the blog, and the best place to keep up with it all is the mailer. Keep the support coming on social media and through the website. We can't believe we're closing in on 80 episodes. Thanks to all of you amazing listeners for seeing us this far. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Jens Volacek and Christoph Reich. Jens, welcome to ReBank. Thank you. You are the founder and CEO of SpotCap. Can you tell us a bit about SpotCap? You guys are an alternative lender. What, what's your business model like? Sure. I mean, SpotCap has been founded in uh, 2014. It's headquartered in Berlin, but operating in, in, in five countries, three countries in, in Europe, Spain, Netherlands, uh, UK, and uh, also Australia and New Zealand. Um, we are, therefore, a multinational fintech lender. We offer credit lines, loans to SMEs, um, mostly rather uh, short-term um, products. Um, we have um, what is maybe special about us, we've developed quite a unique sophisticated credit algorithm focusing on um, cash profiles and real-time performance of banks uh, to yeah, provide uh, basically deep insight into their financial condition to make yeah, a better credit decision, um, particularly on the underserved or um, not fully served clients by banks, which is the majority of all SMEs. Um, yeah, we are a um, um, relatively fast-growing company. We have uh, more than 110 uh, employees, um, have obtained more than 100 million in equity and debt over the first three years. Um, so yeah, uh, I think a very good company at this stage. How much lending have you guys done, or how many how many businesses? So, so yeah, we have lent a couple of thousand SMEs in total. We have lent, um, as we speak, around 130 million in, in, in credit lines, um, um, and yeah, expect to be at 300 end of this year. And um, so. Um, that's kind of the ballpark. Mm-hmm. Numbers go growing two to three times a year over year, um, two and a half to three times actually. Um, so pretty pretty good volumes again for the for three years being in operations. You mentioned the the, the nine digit equity and debt uh, investment that you guys have have, have taken on uh, since since inception. That would kind of suggest, especially the debt component, that you guys are are lending direct, uh, basically off off balance sheet, so to speak. Exactly. So, so exactly. So one of the main, um, you know, um, yeah, of talking point difference in the industry is obviously, I mean, a lot of, especially in the UK, right, a lot of discussion is always about peer to peer, which is um, matching supply and demand. I mean, we do this in a similar way, but more on the institutional side. I.e., we are um, sourcing funds on ourselves from institutionals. We started with kind of. You know, funds from venture capitalist uh, funds, hedge, hedge funds, and have recently moved into um, um, basically bank funding. I see we, we have a line with a bank uh, from from New Zealand, Heartland Bank, um, and we are currently um, in discussions to have the same for, for Europe, which is obviously good news uh, for our funding costs and therefore also for our, our clients we lend to. Um, yeah, and at the same time, we are um, not only a market maker, uh, therefore, but we um, yeah make the decisions also 
make sure that, that this podcast is um, is doing well, uh, which means that uh, yeah, we have so to say skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's um, again an, an integral part of our our value chain and our um, yeah our, our risk models again. I'll, I'll ask you a few more questions, maybe about about spot cap specifically, which, which I think may be uh, may, may kind of provide a bit of a bit of a view into the alternative lending space more more broadly. So, so you guys, you say you lend to SMEs. How do you define SMEs? Yeah. So I mean, normally um, the definition of SMEs uh, sometimes even includes like the micro in there, the micro and small and medium inter enterprises and. Um, SMEs are normally those which I would say which are have up to 10, 15 employees. Um, I would say an average um, turnover of like um, two million um, or, or plus. Uh, maybe not going um, much beyond 10, 15 million because that's then the kind of um, area where um, where bank lending um, at uh, yeah also diff slightly different condition comes into place. Um, but um, yeah, so basically the majority of the businesses. In the economies across all countries and continents, almost is actually the the one where with uh, up to two three million. Um, we see ourselves positioned rather at the um, higher end of that um, of that segment. So we're not um, targeting like completely early stage businesses, but rather those which are in a kind of capital development stage who need uh, money to yeah to grow to manage their their, their cash flow. Um, and yeah, but it's it's a very it's a it's a big uh, segment uh, and an important one of mm -hmm. the of the economy. And and the lending tends to be, is it working capital and kind of unsecured type type lending, or does it tend to be secured yeah. lending? So one of the exactly so it's it's unsecured selectively with personal guarantees by the let's say director of a of a limited company, uh, but in the end. Um, it's, um, it's 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 there's no asset pledge, uh, etc. That's why it's very important to analyze um, the cash profile of, of of the client. Whereas banks tend to normally m rather maybe look at the asset base in a particular way. Um, um, so overall, together with the flexibility and speed of our of the application, but also decision making process, uh, even after money is lent to clients, that's um, it's a very attractive offering uh, to to small businesses. Um, yeah, especially for for those who are. Also doing well, but that's uh, not fully served by banks to, according to their needs. And what what is the kind of average term of, of a loan tend to be? Yeah, so um, it uh, it goes up to fifteen months at the moment. Um, the average lies probably around um, twelve, uh, roughly some bit less, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. So it's around a year, um, which um, is still probably defined as short term, um, exactly, and that's. Uh, that's something where, especially you know, on um, I think about um, much of the purposes of, of, of working capital, like to to manage the cash flow, to bridge receivables, maybe to purchase inventory. That's normally the funding needs, right? Where you uh, turn, let's say, um, the respective investment opportunity around quite quickly, or the need is uh, fulfilled relatively quickly. And that's why short term makes a lot of sense, also for the um, uh, for the borrower, but also makes a lot of sense for for us because it allows us. Um, to um, assess the uh, liquidity risk uh, of, a, of a client in a quite um, yeah um, good way, uh, and also allows us to actually adjust our approach, our models um, in, in various ways as, as the economy, as the development of businesses do also uh, differ over time. Um, so it's for all stakeholders, I would say, I think a good product. And how do interest rates compare to either traditional bank lenders or other alternative lenders, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lenders? Yeah, um, I mean, we have um, our um, our model is um, basically or includes a, a monthly interest rate and an, and an upfront fee, and those interest rate monthly inter interest rates um, start um, for especially for the better clients at uh, at one percent um, per month or below. Uh, they can go to also go up up to one and a half two percent. We do risk based pricing depending on on uh, on the situation also of the business in the stage. Um, in the end. Um, yeah, we are. Um, it's obviously slightly more expensive than a bank uh, lends, and I mean that's not only for us the case, but in general. Um, but given the um, given the the fact that a it's unsecured and b we are also um, uh, turning uh, basically applications uh, into business decisions around within less than twenty four hours, um, and have a lot of other flexibility around the offering, including no repayment uh, fee or early repayment fees. Uh, Etc. It's uh, it's overall um, a very good sweet spot. We have very high customer acceptance 
uh, more than 95% of our credit line offerings get accepted and also drawn. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's a good sweet spot. So it sounds like there are kind of a, a handful of reasons that a business may go via spot cap or, or indeed um, another type of alternative lender or peer-to-peer lender and in, in, in the case of spot cap specifically, it sounds like it's one, because you're able to make a quicker decision, two, because yes. they can access um, unsecured credit, uh, presumably uh, often you know, smaller companies or earlier stage companies or, or perhaps companies with the, 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 that are maybe less financially, uh, I don't want to say less financially sound, but that wouldn't be traditional candidates for bank funding. Uh, and and three that that you offer enhanced flexibility compared to um, to, to to bank products maybe and, and companies would be willing to, to pay a premium for that flexibility. Mm-hmm. Exactly, I think that's that's uh, that's overall um, it's a good uh, good summary. I wouldn't necessarily say that you know our clients are more risky and therefore banks do not lend to it. Um, I think the the problem for them is also on on the small business lending side is um, from a pure cost efficiency point of view with their still relatively manual processes. It's just not um, economically reasonable to do those, um, let's say, credit lines or loans, let's say, up to 100, 150,000 uh, um, euros um, or pounds. Um, and at the same time, they need to put a lot of um, regulatory capital aside because um, the regulators are also assessing the riskiness per se of the um, those smaller businesses as relatively high. So it's not, compared to other opportunities, maybe not as attractive, at least in the past. Um, um, but when, when I look at our portfolio and we have very very low default rates, like very low single-digit uh, non-performing loan ratios, I can definitely confirm that um, now being in, in business for already a few years, that um, yeah, it's not, it's not per se um, a, a matter of, of high-risk clients. It's just about assessing their the, the financial conditions in, in, in the right way, and that maybe also sets us uh, to a certain extent uh, apart from maybe other competitors, and particularly is important for us uh, in the long-term future, uh, because as the industry has grown uh, quite quite heavily over the uh, the last uh, yeah, month and years, uh, it's obviously about uh, the question: say who who survives, who continues uh, to develop well, and I think here it's very very decisive that it's um, also the ones with the better. Um, not only origination approach, but also with better risk models um, to attract borrowers and, and investors. Okay, so, so you guys are you're, you're clearly serving a segment, a niche that uh, the, the banks aren't serving. So it's uh, you know, it's effectively making credit available to, to companies that otherwise wouldn't have many many opportunities to, to access that that credit. It sounds mm-hmm. like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think they haven't done it in the past. I think they're interested in this. Um, they just, uh, at least in the yeah, in the in the past uh, month and years, they, they, I would say, they didn't really know how to tackle that best. And I think here fintech plays a very important role, you know, um, in the entire discussion around alternative lending. There was uh, like in the first wave, there was a lot about you know disruption and 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 and, and how how fintechs can attack banks and so on. Um, and that was maybe. Um, going a bit uh, too far uh, but after this kind of phase and everyone kind of you know making um, its own experience I think banks have also realized there's uh, there's a lot of good um, good innovation and, and positive uh, t- um, yeah, topics around uh, the alternative lending industry and the players which has now for already I would say quite some time now uh, resulted in a more uh, in an era of collaboration uh, and uh, to find out to explore more um, jointly and to create win-win situations um, and that's something um, we have already seen in the industry we are and we are also as spotcap as a company working very intensively now to materialize um, which means that we are um, uh, collaborating partnering with um, with banks to have a um, also a joint offering uh, where they can benefit from the from our insights from the technology and Players such as Spotcap can then uh, benefit from their experience in lending overall and, base, and, and, and their customer base because they have a huge customer base. Also, smaller businesses are just not um, lending efficiently to them, and that's where, where we can help. And we have made the first step in our um, collaboration with with, uh, with Heartland Bank, where there's a debt facility where we have con- uh, content interaction and um, on on um, on a potential commercial partnership, and um, um, relatively soon. Um, also have um, probably good news about a um, bank partnership with the European Bank, um, which is going to be very exciting. Great. Well, look forward to hearing more about that. Um, yeah, sure. 
I suppose the historical context, and, and, and you mentioned um, kind of, you know, first wave of fintech, uh, d- disrupt the banks. Uh, so much of the early activity, uh, you know, at least post-2008 in, in fintech yeah. was, um, payments aside, was in yeah. in lending. And uh, alternative yeah. lending was, was huge at the time, peer-to-peer lending. I, I suppose now, now we're seeing companies that did well, that set themselves up correctly, that, um, that, that, that identified the, the right niches and business models early on. We're, we're now starting to see them flourish, uh, SpotCap being a great example. The... The premise at the time was banks, you know, from 2008 to 11, 12, whenever it uh, happened to be, banks weren't lending to, to, to small business anymore. And therefore, there was a fundamental need for someone else to step in and, and pick up the slack. Uh, similarly, interest rates uh, have kind of been at historic lows over an extended period of time, which means that uh, a lot of assets that traditionally would have yielded much more and uh, assets in which institutional investors, alternative investors would have would have placed funds weren't performing. Plus technology enabled alternative lenders and and alternative lenders funded by institutional investors and, and alternative investors to to access whole loans, to invest in, in whole loans for the first time. And so this kind of this confluence came together to to drive the relative boom in in the space. And again we're you know continue to see that play out and you guys are a great example. A handful of those factors are probably uh, permanent shifts in in, in the market. Uh, you know, I think that incumbent banks have cost structures that are disproportionate to business models which target the two million turnover SME who's looking to borrow fifty k, hundred k, one hundred fifty k. So I think there's there's certainly scope uh, on on a forward looking basis for alternative lenders to continue to be prosperous in that space. I think incumbent bank cost structures aren't changing anytime soon. Over time, I think we'll we'll certainly see interest rates rebound to mid single digits at the very least as economic cycles continue to evolve. How would changes like that, uh, changes in the interest rate environment, potentially inform institutional investor, alternative investor appetite for for direct lending? I mean, the uh, the the influence of changes in interest rate is obviously it's a very it's a very tricky one, right? There are a lot of components uh, what what in rise in interest rate um, does to the industry uh, uh, or the economy overall, but particularly also to the alternative uh, lending industry. I mean, first of all, when looking at um, alternative lenders, I think um, uh, what it probably does is, um, and also as you mentioned before, there was a lot of uh, a lot of players which um, which emerged uh, um, after two thousand eight, um, and I think what it does is it basically separates, the, I would say, the good and the bads uh, in a way that the ones who have um, um, have a have a good success story, which have again proper risk models, who have still a decent performance. Um, they will also attract investors and also have a good offering to borrowers, uh, despite of the fact that interest rate might go up. I personally believe that um, it will, it, over the next 12, 14, 24 months, it, it will go up, but not to a, a very high level. Um, so it's going to be a moderate increase, but still it, it, it does change uh, certain things in the industry. Um, so that's, I would almost say, good news to, uh, for the industry, which obviously is about to mature or slightly matured already, depends a bit from which country you look into, but uh, also when looking into the UK, um, I think um, it will just help the businesses to become even better, the alternative uh, businesses. At the same time, because um, a higher interest rate also means for the borrowers that um, maybe they invest a bit less, they have maybe lower cash needs, their, their, their refinancing costs themselves go up, and therefore maybe uh, defaults will also slightly increase, uh, which again is a stretch to, to, the, um, to the performance. Um, of them turning going into the investor side um, again, um, obviously I think in the asset class itself uh, might not struggle a bit, but, but might be impacted. I mean, at the same time, I think um, maybe some investors go away from uh, investing in stocks, which they do heavily at the moment. Uh, then obviously in, uh, in more in, in in the bond market, um, but I think. Um, as interest rates go up, also the um, gross yields will, will go up. Maybe the spread changes a bit, but I think they can still make um, a good margin in direct lending, um, investing in, into into wholesale loans. 
Um, so that's something, especially when the, uh, if it's not only about the gross yield, but the net yield, if that's still sufficient for them. And that's also something which was, I think, quite intensively discussed in the past uh, in the industry, like which platform actually performs uh, well after, after um, loan losses. Uh, and that becomes probably an even more crucial um, um, part of the story. Um, and in the, but most interestingly, I would say it's also then for the banks itself who will have the possibility to maybe even earn more money on direct lending um, or lending to small businesses. Um, at the moment, they're not really doing this, and which also means then um, that um, um, it, the overall sector becomes even more interesting for them. And uh, given their is that a challenge, as you mentioned it, on the cost structure and the general approach to small business lending, um, the uh, interest in, in, let's say, collaborating with fintech players uh, might even inc further increase, uh, which is, again, then good news for the industry, in particular for the ones which are um, yeah, set up uh, in, a, in a good way, um, like, like SpotCap, for instance, um, from my point of view. And uh, I think that's why... Um, yes, it's a, it's a complex model what industry change, uh, changes will do, um, but um, I think the industry will definitely uh, go on, and the good players will also it's a good do good business. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. That it it's all kind of all signs point point toward further collaboration, uh, and, and in fact, the the right model perhaps being one of close partnership between banks and and, and alternative lenders, and clearly the right alternative lenders, those that do the right kind of business, those that are structured in the right sort of way, those that have the, the right credit underwriting process. Um, what are your feelings about peer-to-peer -peer lending? It has its um, downside when it comes to the flexibility and the, the, and the speed to serve the borrowers because, um, you know, um, being a market maker then put the loan on the platform, which then needs to be funded by whether retail or institutional investors still takes a bit of time and uh, there's certain inflexi uh, inflexible um, um, yeah, characteristics around that which an own balance sheet lender, for instance, can serve, like us, mm -hmm. can serve um, uh, or, or tackle in a better way. Uh, at the same time, um, there's always that, uh, whenever I talk to also investors, there's always that problem that there is no so called skin in the game. So they're a market maker, they assess the uh, riskiness of the borrower. And then later on, uh, in terms of loan performance, you're going to see whether they have done a good decision. And if not, yeah, then they have, might have. Uh, uh, slightly harder times to um, to uh, to attract new investors, but uh, the existing investors um, have to pay the bill, uh, and not them. Uh, and that's again also kind of different uh, uh, different to us, right? Because um, we are basically if we make good decisions, uh, we have a better spread. If not, then um, yeah, we have a problem. And that's what investors don't like so much sometimes about peer to peer, but more about other uh, models in the alternative lending sector. But again. Pros and cons um, on the awareness side, uh, side it definitely helps um, uh, to also have that retail investor component uh, in, the, in the awareness in the industry, which is, by the way, different in the UK and in Germany, for instance, because in Germany, people tend to not uh, look for so much for, for yield and I would even say alternative asset classes. They like deposits uh, and uh, safe bets. Um, and slightly maybe different to the UK, and that's why maybe apart from the fact that UK was first, um, that Germany... Um, P2P in Germany is, is still not as prominent uh, um, as in the UK, but it's catching. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. Uh, even thinking more broadly and, and thinking about some of the, the, the US peer-to-peer uh, -peer lenders, where perhaps the, the risk tolerance or, or I suppose propensity to invest as opposed to save is even higher. The the positioning, the messaging in Europe, uh, it's often kind of you can't can't call it savings, and you have to to point out the fact that your quote unquote investment is is subject to to losses, but it's definitely painted as akin to saving in in Europe, whereas uh, whereas in, in, in the US it's generally pitched as an investment class. And I think the the returns then that investors uh, expect and, and therefore the types of lending that's being done are, are different as a result. I mean, me personally, I feel that although it's quite attractive for the reach, I mean, uh, from a proposition as well, I don't think um, that peer-to-peer -peer is actually something particularly right for retail investors because they're just lagging the knowledge. I mean, there are obviously ways, you know, to spread the risk. You can invest maybe a certain players are offering the possibility to basically spread a certain investment amount over um, yeah, a portfolio, so to say, of loans. Um, but still, there's not so much of diversification potentially in there. Uh, and there's a reason why um, um, yeah, retail investors normally 
um, get get certain advice here, and that's probably becoming very important um, also in the in the future. Because uh, as you said it right, so if it's about um, savings, uh, at least how it's positioned maybe in in, in Europe, then it's um, um, it's a different story because there is uh, there is a risk in there, especially if the the platform is not making the right decisions. Um, and then the question is, is that is that yield enough um, uh, also going going forward? Um, but again, they wouldn't just understand the, the the upside and the downside properly. So I think it's particularly, and I think that's also different in the US. There are much more institutional investors uh, um, uh, who are investing in those loans, uh, those wholesale loans, than uh, still in, in Europe to a certain extent, which are more retail investor based still uh, to a certain extent. Um, but potentially this will also change over time. It, it appears that a handful of peer to peer lenders lately have been making tweaks to their business models and and hearsay would suggest that that's been driven by an inability to originate loans i.e find find people that want to borrow money do you get the same sense um yes and no i mean um again it depends on where you look at i mean in, in the u.s i think uh, looking at the bigger players they have actually cut origination uh, on purpose to, uh, because they were too aggressive and the, lo- the credit losses were too high, and the investors weren't very pleased, and that has, I think, had that had a big impact on the entire industry. Um, because the US is still the, uh, the biggest one. I mean, actually, China is relatively big as well. But in terms of the overall, um, yeah, reputation, I think people still look into the to the, towards the US, and um, so that was something um, um, which uh, was a dominant factor um, um, there. And I think in Europe, uh, it's obviously also it was there was a select, selective news also about some potential higher losses. But um, at the same time, um, uh, the industry, apart from the from, from the credit quality, it's still um, a matter of, uh, of, of of awareness and market share in terms of lending versus the traditional uh, industry. And I think that's something which where there is still a long way to go for the industry to become more mainstream because the product is actually mainstream. It's just that the uh, the mainstream target segment um, uh, doesn't know about this yet. And here uh, that's also something where I think um, associations, uh, government, etc. has to do more. I mean, UK was maybe something, especially after 2008, uh, who has been... Um, Kind of a, a relative role model um, to promote that sector, but uh, overall, um, has to be there has to be more, and it's also important for investors, um, uh, not only adept but also equity investors, to understand that to understand the, uh, the and, and therefore investing money in, in the growth of that sector uh, to continue, uh, especially in the good in the good models, um, to make those players a more kind of mainstream players. So uh, overall, it's still probably about doing good origination, um, the right origination. Yeah, um, not any any anything crazy, uh, because uh, you can can certainly start to approve at, um, or increase your approval rate by by whatever a factor of two to do more, but then you pay it later. Um, and that's probably doesn't help the overall industry then in terms of confidence to attract yep. investors. So we we touched on the fact that the fintech alternative lending space, if if, if we can call that, grew out of the the two thousand eight. Financial crisis. Uh, we will we will inevitably uh, see another um, negative financial shock at some point. Um, what what will happen to alternative lending when 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 that next economic crisis hits? Yeah, I mean, certain players will, will just disappear because their performance will will be um, will, will massively uh, will be massively hit. Uh, and they will probably either not find new debt or no equity investments to continue. That's just a fact. Um, I think every uh, downturn also has uh, obviously it's uh, something positive about you know um, um, making the the industry more robust, especially afterwards. Um, um, on the other side, I think um, what's interesting even for the larger players is that um, obviously when they then see how their their models actually performed um, first time because um, I mean. Um, many also of the peer-to-peer players they are actually lending three to five years uh, like the terms of three to five years that's quite long um, for businesses which are maybe out there for for, for like five years um, and that's always what uh, has been maybe also criticized and um, I think Spotcap uh, for instance we are doing as I said 12 months terms and that's we do reassessments on a regular basis so we have actually quite uh, quite some um, 
some some um, yeah mechanics to to basically adjust uh, also our uh, approach to underwriting as the economy changes and um, because our portfolio our book turns around um, uh, around more than two times a year um, and that's something which uh, a lot of the bigger players um, especially in peer to peer do not have so. Um, if there is a crisis, there's obviously they've done some stress testing, and there's some buffer, but uh, their performance will be, be hit, and the and the, the consequences could be quite um, and severe. And I hope that it's uh, their, their models have been good enough um, to um, yeah to be to not uh, have a shock there, uh, which then obviously again affects the entire industry, even the good players, um, because it's about reputation also among institutionals. Um, but in the end, it will, will clean up the industry. Um, the best ones will survive, and the ones will then obviously further collaborate also with institutional players, um, and maybe the mainstream alternative um, uh, banks and lenders also in the future. Jens, what's the best way for people to find out more about Spotcap and connect with you directly? Um, there are multiple ways to get in touch with them. I mean, we are we are present on uh, obviously on, on 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 LinkedIn, on 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 social media, uh, but there's uh, the simplest way is to go to um, www.spotcap.com and there are um, uh, the contact details um, of, um, of yeah, the main um, 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 people and um, yeah, you can uh, directly just call us or write us and uh, we, we hope to, to help. Great. Jens Volachuk, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Will. It was a pleasure. Christoph, welcome to ReBank. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So, firstly, it's great to catch up again. I think we first met years ago at this point, probably three years ago at a, at a Finextra conference. We were on a panel together. Yeah, it's amazing what happened over the last three years. Yeah, well, your guys' progress specifically is probably worth talking about. So, you're the founder of iWalka. I would describe it as an alternative lender. You can correct me. But um, tell, me about, tell me about iWalka and some of the, the highlights since we last connected. So at Avoca, we are um, helping small businesses access financing. Um, we would like it to be as simple as booking a flight ticket. And so a lot of our product development is going in that direction to really make it as seamless and as simple as possible, but also break all of the barriers that currently stands between small businesses and financing. Mm -hmm. And um, they are clearly sort of related to access, but they're also related to the, to the mindset of, of small businesses of what they can do with additional financing, which in many cases is not, is not something that comes natural to them. And over the last few years, we have funded more than 15,000 small businesses. We have funded um, more than 350 million in, in, in loans and are operating here in the UK, Germany and Poland. So the, the alternative lending space, at least the, the modern iteration of it, feels like it grew out of the the financial crisis in a sense uh you know 2008 9 10 banks were kind of reeling from from losses uh and were facing increasing capital requirements imposed by regulators and and they kind of tightened up lending in a lot of cases and that left a lot of sme businesses in particular short on funding and I think there was, a, there was kind of a, a movement at that point to find ways to solve that problem. I think you're only partially right that it's um, been born out of the financial crisis. Um, absolutely you're right. The financial crisis made things a lot worse for small business lending. Um, but there have been many, many businesses even prior to the crisis who weren't ac able to access uh, bank financing for, for their business. And typically, um, if you think of a small business that turns over 100,000 or 200,000 um, euros, dollars, pounds, they are not um, your typical business customer at a bank and the bank never had a real system to, to lend to them. And generally speaking, they're also higher risk to um, the bank's appetite um, and fall out of their, their risk spectrum. So you are right that um, the banks have left the void and that void is increasing and we continue to see that. But there has been a big segment that wasn't served at all prior to that. So I think for us, it started because technology made it possible for us to enter into the market and come up with a solution um, that makes the process much more convenient and also enables us to understand the risk in a more granular way 
than um, than was possible before. So through technology and integrations, you know, we started with eBay and Amazon um, because they had APIs that you can connect to and you can see the trading history of businesses. But have expanded that over time to read um, bank statements automatically, to integrate directly with banks, to understand. Um, the, under the data that they have on, on their customers to plug into accountancy platforms and, and, and many others. So the, I think the real driver behind the um, innovative alternative lending has been the availability of um, data, which it didn't have to that extent in 2005 or earlier, um, but which really kind of started um, you know, about, about 10 years ago. For the benefit of the, of the audience, how would you describe your your model is it fully automated is it it's automatically credit scored it's smart algorithms in the back that are obviating the need for human intervention and lending takes care of itself is that is that broadly the thesis or at least the aspiration so our our credit facilities go from a thousand pounds to a hundred fifty thousand pounds and um, at these various stages we have um, um, different levels of automation so, you know, a big chunk of the decisions that we're taking are fully automated without anyone looking at that. And, um, um, and as you get sort of to the higher loan values, we have a very automated process in, in data gathering, um, but we do have some, some manual review. So I think it's an, it's an evolution that we have gone through to first automate all of the processes that um, you require as part of the, the, the journey and also as part of the data assessment and uh, visualization for someone to look at it um, to then um, completely automating the, um, the process to the extent that um, um, no human being would be looking over this or would be part of the transaction. So it's an evolution from, you know, scratch where clearly, um, you know, the first ones we had to learn how to do a credit decision ourselves to the full automation where no one is, is having a, a touch point. And mm -hmm. today, there's a chunk um, of our customers that will go through the system without any intervention. Mm -hmm. And that chunk is increasing. And so the reason that you have the manual double check at a certain point in terms of loan size is purely risk management, or it's because they're more complex transactions, they're, they're elements that are more difficult to automate and that require some sort of human touch. It's um, um, it's risk management. Yeah. Um, that the larger the transaction becomes, um, the more um, we feel a human can have um, the ability to um, to add additional input into into the system, which a um, which an algorithm would miss otherwise. Mm -hmm. How how flexible in in your view are digital lenders able to be in terms of deal structure? I mean, is it one type of loan it's unsecured it's to businesses who have minimum you know x y and z in terms of you know credit parameters and then it's a yes and if not it's a no or is it is there scope for guaranteed lending director guarantees security cash flow lending versus you know commercial mortgage style term lending how much flexibility is there in the market and you know i don't want to single out I walk but in, in the market broadly, you know, the, the, the world of alternative lenders, how much customization have, pe have people been able to build into digital lending uh, versus how much of it is required to be you know, relatively straightforward? I think in the different markets in which we're operating and we see different levels of, of, um, of options that customers have, I think the UK is probably leading um, by being the most diverse in its options. and. You find um, anything from receivable financing um, to, um, of course, secured to um, uh, property, um, second lien, first lien, and that's business, um, consumers. So you know we definitely have a wide um, diversity. Our mission was to provide funding to the millions of businesses that um, do not have a significant amount of hard assets in their business and therefore fall out of that spectrum where you can use some sort of security um, and value that and then lend, lend against that. So from the outset, our product has been as universally usable or applicable to um, small businesses that typically have in the low hundred thousands of, 
of revenues and go up to the very few you know, one, two, three million pound um, businesses. And um, we have been very strong in making this product as accessible and as seamless as possible. And I think from here, we, we can and have the platform to um, do more product development ourselves and provide um, to our customer base that is using us and that we're marketing to um, additional products which um, are um, slightly more bespoke and mm-hmm. um, fulfilling additional needs that they have. Mm-hmm. So does, does cash flow tend to be the key metric that you guys are looking at when you're making a credit decision in terms cash of flow repayment? Is, um, um, because the, the the product that we're offering is a revolving credit facility and and used by by small businesses to bolster their their cash flow, um, cash flow is a very important element of um, um, of our credit analysis. But so is the credit history of the business, as well as um, the um, credit history of the owners behind um, behind the business. Mm-hmm. In your view, are there reasons that well, I suppose you mentioned uh, risk, risk appetite, but over and above that, are there other reasons why banks aren't servicing this space? Are they somehow either missing an opportunity or underserving customers when they should be doing more? I, I think um, it's um, exactly sort of the two things that you're mentioning. I, I do think they are underserving a relatively large part in numbers of their customer base by simply not providing them with the financing that these customers need to grow to their potential. And um, and I also do think that they're missing an, an opportunity, but that has been um, the case um, for decades. So, uh, you know, it's, I haven't seen a changing dramatically um, over the last over the last six years, as I said, with the, um, over the last, since we started, um, or since the financial crisis, um, things have continued to deteriorate and the funding gap has widened, not closened which um, shows you that the the deleveraging by banks is still ongoing and they're still delevering from higher risk portfolios, which arguably small businesses, of course, fall into. Um, A business that turns over 100 or 200,000 pounds is not as stable as um, a medium-sized company that turns over 25 million and uh, and a solid two to seven million profit per year. Do you guys lend off your own balance sheet? We've always lent off our own balance sheet and we had that privilege because we raised um, um, vast amounts of, of, of equity from venture capital funds and, um, and also debt cap- capital through banks. Um, some of our um, investors are um, equity investors are large banks as Commerce Bank and, and um, in, in TESA and that enabled us um, to build a balance sheet um, that made it possible to lend to this customer group, which no one really did um, before, before before we started doing um, that here in the in the UK. So there wasn't a track record that um, any investor could have taken and uh, and said, "I'm happy to lend um, these businesses money, and I'm I'm carrying the entire risk of um, um, the money that, um, that that I lent." So um, to be able to build our our IP, our credit scoring, our understanding of the risk in the segment, we had to absorb the risk ourselves. It would not have been responsible to pioneer in something completely new and use retail money to do that. Some alternative lenders, uh, Cabbage comes to mind, have partnered with banks. I think uh, in, in the UK, Cabbage and Santander have, have a partnership where they, they do some um, basically loan origination loans are underwritten maybe by cabbage if they fall into a certain category if they're outside of santander's risk appetite there's there's even some legislation in the uk requiring banks to push non-qualifying credit applications to alternative lenders in certain cases do you guys work with any banks in the uk germany or poland the markets in which you operate uh, we work with a number of banks, actually. Um, as I said, we have um, Intesa, San Paolo, and Commons Bank invested in us, and so naturally we have um, close ties to them. Um, we partnered up with Royal Bank of Scotland here in the in the in the UK. We work with Hypofinance Bank, which is part of UniCredit, and in in Germany, and we have a very tight um, partnership with Fido Bank in um, in Germany that um, um, is 
has outsourced um, all of their small business lending to us. We also have partnered up with the fintech um, that is uh, providing credit to their members. That is Tide, um, a digital bank or digital account provider, I should say um, to be precise. And um, and our lending is um, completely seamlessly um, accessible through the app. So whoever is a tight member can apply for credit on the app and would um, never leave the app um, to get um, financing and can draw down this financing without ever speaking or having any interaction with us. So it, in that case, it is 100% automated without mm. any, any manual intervention. Uh, that is um, the, the most advanced integration of, of its kind. So we do have uh, been very active on, on, on that front and are open to speak to, to more partners and you know, think that this is a very viable growth channel for us. Mm. When people think of alternative lending, uh, some people may first think of the likes of Prosper Lending Club, Zopa, peer-to-peer lenders, and they're peer-to-peer lenders that do consumer lending, they're peer-to-peer lenders that do business lending. Uh, there are also, as you mentioned, some players that focus on specific categories. So maybe it's invoice finance versus you know, com- commercial property development lending, something like that. And then there's the broad category in which Iwaka sits, which is the accessing wholesale funding from investors and effectively lending off balance sheet or lending out of wholesale wholesale facilities that, that they that they have access to. In your view, are there different risk profiles across those types of alternative lenders? The P2P lending model has drawn uh, an, an increasing amount of concern, I think, uh, recently in terms of is there an appropriate alignment with between platforms and investors in terms of risk, in terms of uh, incentivization for, for origination, what happens in a rising interest rate environment. Do you feel like all business models are, are made equal from a, a risk standpoint? I think you have seen um, banks making bad lending decisions um, off their balance sheet and um, resulting in distress on, on, on their operations in the, in the past. So I don't think um, the, the business model per se is protecting you against, um, against um, bad credit decisions. Um, bad credit decisions are a result of poor governance or a result of um, um, having too ambitious gross decisions and lowering your standards too much or can be because of a um, you know, very severe downturn in an economy and then it's a question you know, how, how, how good your decisions or how safe you, your lending was um, <clears throat> to see how much um, losses you'll be taking. So I think it's a, you know, as a credit company, regardless whether you're a peer-to-peer platform or balance sheet lender, you're always at risk of, um, of having losses based on the decisions you make today. But I do agree that um, um, as a balance sheet lender, there is a slight sort of difference possibly from a psychological point of view because um, you, know, you feel the losses to some extent um, a little bit more by, by, um, by absorbing them with your own, own equity. I do think it's a timing issue. So as a peer-to-peer platform, you're also seeing the losses coming through. Um, but the impact on, on, your, on your investor base is, is, is um, probably delayed. Um, and um, as a lender, in our case, that is relatively speaking at the shorter term of the credit spectrum, so typically um, in revolving credit facilities, we would um, have no longer than 12 months in repayment horizons. We see losses coming through significantly faster than if you have a book that typically has a duration of, um, of, of five years or, or longer. And, um, and so there's um, more, I think, that, that from a business perspective, it's more, you know, at what sort of spectrum of the curve are you? Are you in the shorter term where you see it quite quickly and, and, um, and therefore the impact is visible much faster versus sort of whether you have it at a very um, far end. And, um, and so I think, um, peer-to-peer platforms are um, 
in the same category as balance sheet lenders, but possibly kind of, um, you know, a tad less sensible um, to losses than a balance sheet lender for that reason. Mm. Sounds like a very diplomatic answer. No, no doubt, very well, well thought out. Question just out of pure curiosity. Do you, do you invest on any peer-to-peer lending platforms personally? Um, I have um, very little cash in, um, in, in, in peer-to-peer lending, but as an entrepreneur, sadly, all of my business is um, in my business, so there isn't, isn't huge room for me to invest in other platforms. Fair enough. You mentioned the integration. No. <laughs> nor, nor, nor would I. <laughs> um, you mentioned some of the integrations you guys have with accounting platforms and, and increasing work uh, around effectively accessing different sources of, of data to, to inform credit underwriting. In the traditional model, at least, and, and largely speaking, the, the, the current model, if someone wants to loan, they go to the lender or maybe a broker and, uh, and, and apply for that loan. Are you doing any work or, or do you expect to be doing any work in the, the near-ish term in terms of, I don't know, maybe making credit available d- directly to businesses through their accounting platforms, i.e. they're not coming to Iwaka for the loan. You guys are sitting behind another tool that they're already using and making automated decisions and kind of pushing you know, credit lines to them as they need them. Um, absolutely. So that is what we have done uh, with Zero. For example, through the marketplace, you can get financing uh, from iWalker and all of the loan information is immediately passed and dynamically passed to the Zero pl- uh, platform so that you as a business do not have to import all of this information um, separately. And it, I think it's sort of similar um, to Titan. Um, as I said initially, we want to make it as simple as booking a flight ticket. So arguably, we would see a lot of the volume moving to um, um, to price comparison platforms, which at large is not possible today because no one else has that level of automation. So um, there isn't yet enough pull um, on, on, on these platforms to make it really as attractive, for example, as insurance contracts or, or consumer lending. And, um, and so I think... We want to bring the financing where the business really needs that. And I think the accounting platform is a great place because they have more engagement with accounting, with the accounting platform and can finance the invoices directly by clicking, you know, a button, please sort of finance that invoice. Um, or on these comparison platforms or on other places where they're purchasing their, um, their stock or other services. I think financing today in, a, in such a, techno- in a in a world where technology makes it possible should really be as much tied to um, their operations as, as possible. I think it's a thing of the past in 20 years time that you would um, go as often to a bank to request financing as you would still do today. Mm-hmm. I guess that suggests that banks also should be rethinking some of their distribution and should maybe be a bit more active in terms of integration, not least as the likes of open banking and PSD2 start to become real. That's correct. It's just much harder if you have um, tens of billions already on your balance sheet um, to to make these, these changes, and I think they will eventually all lose out. All right, so... Stepping back a little bit and uh, and thinking about fintech more broadly, you're you know clearly very uh, very deeply placed in the in the lending space. But outside of lending, what areas of fintech do you view as most powerful, most potentially transformational? You know what I'm spending on a month to month basis is still um, very opaque to me. You kind of know the rough amounts, but where exactly you're spending it on what? services or products you're spending it and if these are commoditized then how that compares to people who are like me or people who are living in my area is um, you have no benchmark really to that and I think if open banking or PSD2 can, um, can accelerate or can trigger 
that, that change, that people become more savvy about their spending behaviors, and I think it will completely change the way how people think about um, their, 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 their finances. And I think that sort of will unlock um, a really interesting development in you know, all kinds of areas. It might be that people will say, I'm spending way too much on my mobile phone usage versus everyone else, or I'm spending way too much on my utility bills, or I'm spending way too much in um, in in any restaurants, cafes, it would definitely or be restaurants other places for me. where millennials <laughs> kind of um, spend their spend their money. And of course, sort of it extends to financial services. I'm spending too much on on interest rate uh, payments um, versus anyone else who's like me. Um, so I think that's going to be really, really, really interesting. Mm. So a lot of base needs and sort of lending and, and you know, payments as well as foreign exchange have been addressed. And I think it's time, well, as time flows, they will just have a bigger penetration. But if you ask me what will be the biggest impact on, on sort of the behavioral change is sort of the understanding, a much better understanding of your finances going forward. Mm. How, will, how will SME lending be different 10 years from now? We will make it um, so that it becomes as natural to use as it is for people to take a mobile phone and think of it as a contract where you're benchmarking it against the number or the, the, the amount of um, data that you're consuming. It's a in essence, it's a credit contract because you're receiving a hardware device for a few hundred pounds and are consuming a service on top of it. But from a consumer perspective, it's, um, it's a completely normal um, to see it as a phone contract with data. And that makes the transaction completely seamless that reduces any fear which historically and still today is related to um, um, to credit agreements and the stigma if you if you're not living up to the terms, and and I think um, we will make the product much more user friendly from that perspective to make it much more natural to use as a as a mean of flexible payment terms. Christoph, what's the best way for people to find out more about Iwaka and connect with you directly? The best is to go on our website or call us. Um, we're very proud to have a great customer service. So, um, you know, I would invite everyone to give us a shout and, um, and hear from, from, from our team what our product can do and what we can do for them. All right. Well, Christoph Reich, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, Check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.